please, if you see something today, say something. All right? The questions, the questions are great. Even, honestly, the question of, hey, coach, what are all those players doing at the other end of the pool? Why are they sitting? That's great. It means you're paying attention, you're involved. So no question is stupid. I'm the guy in the audience a lot of time, raising my hand, asking questions. Somebody has a question, probably someone else does. Do not hesitate. Put your hand up and ask. That's kind of what this is all about. So don't be afraid, okay? No one's going to bite your head off, and all questions are good questions. Today, we're going to talk about foundation for a successful season, successful program, and in reference to uh, your culture, your team culture, okay? So, we begin as water polo coaches just deciding that we want to coach, usually, right? We love the sport, we play the sport, we have a passion for it, and we decide we want to coach. So what do we do? We start coaching. And that's kind of how we do it. We just start out, we just, with very little, none, no formal structure, no nothing, we just start coaching. And we kind of find our way. And if we, and if we have the desire to delve deeper into what kind of coaching is all about and what it all means, we do that. But we don't ever receive really any formal structural training about leadership. And we just kind of wing it and figure it out as we go. So, but, you know, leadership is more than just X's and O's. It's more than just, I know how to teach the fundamentals, I have a passion for teaching, and that kind of stuff. Real leadership involves more than that. It involves the culture of the program that you're leading. The foundation of the program is your team culture. And so, today we're going to talk about... Um, this essential foundation, your building blocks for your program, and how to go about kind of getting started on that if you haven't already. All right, so this quote, everybody knows this quote. This is the man, the myth, the legend, John Wooden. Mm -hmm. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And I'm talking about preparation in a different sense. We talked yesterday about video preparation. Again, X's and O's, knowing the fundamentals, structuring your practice. In this sense, we're talking about preparing the foundation of your program through really diving deeper into your values. Okay, so team culture is part of your preparation. These birds, what are they called? Anybody know? They're called starlings. Okay, and have you ever seen these incredible bird formations? Have you ever seen the videos of them? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so the, the cool thing about the starlings is you know, it's a metaphor for your, for your, how you interact with each other in a team sport, right? So it, these birds are communicating with each other in subtle ways that keep them from running into each other, right? And they've done research into what it is and how they communicate, but it's kind of a metaphor for, for your team culture, how well you, you interact with each other. These birds are flying around in incredible formations and they're not running into each other. How do they do it? Well, this is our, our metaphor. So why should we, co why should we focus on our team culture? I'll tell you why. Because your team culture exists one way or another. It's a thing, okay? And it, you might as well take control of it and make it something that's beneficial to your program. You might as well, okay? Having a strong team culture is going to allow you to build on that. It's going to help you weather the inevitable storms that are going to attack your team. And these storms can come in many different forms. Uh, you know, just in, internal stuff that always exists, behavioral issues, uh, uh, perhaps the loss of a player to injury that, that uh, throws your plan off a little bit. Your culture is going to help you weather these storms. Your house will not blow over. Um, and so it's important. And if you don't address it, and if you don't take care of it, it's going to exist. Okay? And so it's better that it's well-defined and explained and beneficial to your program that it is, well, it's just kind of understood how we do things here. And when it's just kind of understood, then that's not understood. And then you can have players who understand it one way and players who understand it another. And so we're not on the same page. And the beauty of the team experience is that you're bringing all of these different parts, all of these different characters of people that are lending themselves to the greater good. And that's the magic of a team sport. And your culture is essential to that functioning well. Okay? So we'll, we'll get started with a couple ideas about how to do this. These have been my experiences, things that I've learned uh, in, my, in my experience, my coaching education. Okay, the first thing 
that a coach or a leader should do is clearly define norms and rules for behavior. Okay? And so, how do you do that? Well, the, 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 the expectations for the behavior, they need to be established right away. If you haven't done that already, that is something that you should do. Even if you run a club that trains two nights a week, everybody should know, hey, this is how, this, these are the boundaries in which we can operate. We all need boundaries. There's a quote from one of my favorite uh, uh, coaching books that says, you know, whether we know it or not, we want discipline. Athletes want and are, are yearning for discipline and structure. Because with boundaries, we can understand where we can operate. And within these boundaries, we can operate freely. In a sense, it frees us to be ourselves. As long as we understand, okay, I can't cross this line and that one. We've got this structure that helps us you know, to understand what we can do and what we can't. So we should, we should establish the rules right away. They should be posted. And then we should make sure that we stick to them. Right? That's important. Yes? We did a Yeah. And we had each of the athletes and their parents sign it. That's so excellent. That was all in writing. They yep. see it. That's great because we're going to show you one of those in two slides. That's awesome. No, no, that's excellent. You're going to say that's a great way to get started doing it. Have a code of conduct or expectations um, sheet that player. And if you have young players, player and parent sign. Good. Okay. <clears throat> one of the ways that we can do this is, as you just said, a code of conduct. Okay, well, the next step, excuse me before I go on. So, we're, first thing we're doing is clearly establishing our, um, our rules and norms for behavior. The next thing that we're going to do is dive into what our core values of our program are. And this is a tremendously valuable experience that I've been through as a coach. And we'll go through a little bit of an exercise together, and I'm going to ask for your participation. So, please be ready to help out with this when we go forward, okay? And then lastly, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about outcome and process goals for your team. Okay, one of the hallmarks, one of the trademarks of all, all successful leadership programs, whether it's corporate world or whatever, even my, my children's elementary school classroom, goals, rules, expectations, they're all posted on the wall. Here's how we behave here, right? This is important stuff. Okay. So let's talk about a code of conduct. So you just mentioned your code of conduct. You call it a contract or something like that. So one of the ways that we can establish the rules and norms for behavior is through a code of conduct. Okay? A code of conduct is more like a contract. So it's more detailed than maybe your team rules would be. And I'm gonna and um, but some guidelines for establishing rules are as follows. One is the KISS theory. You guys familiar with the KISS theory? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Simple. Stupid. Keep it simple and systematic if you want to be, uh, you know, that. So keep the rules simple. Don't make them too complicated. All right. The next next guideline is all right. How many rules should we have? Okay. Same coaching book I referenced earlier. It's called Coaching the Mental Game by H. A. Dorfman. I like this book a lot, and uh, I reference it all the time in my uh, coaching leadership class that I have to teach as part of my job requirement at UC Davis. Um, one, of the, one of the examples he gives is there's, a, there's a, a two drinking fountains. He taught uh, junior high, I think. So drinking fountain on one side, drinking fountain on the other. One side of the hall has a drinking fountain with all sorts of rules of things that you shouldn't do, like no spitting, no this, that, a list of rules. The other has no rules. This one is covered with spit, gum, and everything, and this one is clean. So, too many rules can be a bad thing. Also, when making rules, you got to think about the specificity specifically in terms of the punishment, the repercussions for the violations uh, of behavior. Because if you're too specific and you don't build any leeway for yourself, you can paint yourself into a corner that you don't want to be in. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. So, I'm going to give you an example of our code of conduct from UC Davis. And you, the first thing you're going to say is, you did not keep it simple, stupid. Watch. Okay. There you go. There's a lot of rules here. This is more of a, con a contract than it is just sort of team rules. Okay? And it is complicated for a reason. Okay? As an NCAA Division I athlete, you are required to know certain things. There are certain things that must be in this code of conduct. For example, 
You're required to know the NC2A rules, and there's a lot of them. For example, betting on sports. If you bet on sports, it's an NC violation. You can, use, you can lose your eligibility. Performance enhancing substances, all that kind of stuff. Hazing also, alcohol, drug abuse. These things need to be in there. And then we have a couple other rules. Um, social media, right? Tweeting and all that. So you can get yourself into trouble, trouble tweeting, and Snapchat and all that kind of stuff. So you gotta know this stuff. That's why it's in there. You can see at the bottom that um, the players are required to sign it. And so they keep a copy, I keep a copy. They're posted in our team room. It's up on the board where people can see it. Okay? Now, I want to take a look at one of the rules in more detail. All right? So here we go. Playing for the UC Davis men's water polo team is a great honor and privilege that can be revoked at any time at the discretion of the coaching staff. Players who demonstrate lack of commitment to our goals or are a discipline problem are subject to disciplinary action, including suspension and or removal from the team. Okay, so there's our rule. Is it general? Is there leeway in there for decisions in terms of punishment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, okay. And, and because being too specific about the ramifications for the violation of behavior, like I said, you can paint yourself into a corner. If, if with the greatest intentions, we say something like, all right, you missed three practices, you're not playing in the next game. That's our rule. Okay, well, there's obviously extenuating circumstances that can exist. Let's say there was a traffic accident on the way to practice, or maybe somebody's uh, family member passed away and they had to miss. Do you really want to be stuck in a situation where you say, okay, you have to miss the game? That's our rule. That doesn't really seem like the right thing to do, does it? So you got to build yourself in some leeway, and then the next thing is you have to master the art. We have to master the art of being fair with our punishment and consistent, and that's not easy. Because there's going to be a lot of situations that you have to decide what you're doing and you want to make sure that it's fair. You don't want to alienate anybody on the team. You, don't want to, you, don't, you do not want to uh, uh, give the impression that you're giving favoritism to any person. So you've got to be fair and consistent with your punishment. And this is a way that you can help yourself out. All right, here's an example of uh, Pete Carroll's team rules. These are his rules. Always protect the team. No whining, no complaining, no excuses, and be early. Okay? So these are simple. <clears throat> and this kind of gives you a, a feel for what his program's like and allows for leeway, judgment. When violations arise, they're logical. Also, it's important to keep in mind that these are professional athletes that he's dealing with. Okay? So they operate in a little bit of a different way. Um, and they might, for example, rebel against too many rules. Um, in any case, you developed your rules, you've taken the time, and you know what, this is a process that you can go through with your team if you want. Giving your team val uh, uh, input into the, the foundational aspects of the program can be empowering to your players. So if you have a meeting where you say, hey, let's, we want to establish some rules, some basic guidelines for how we're going to behave, and you, you ask for input from them, you know, it's very powerful. They feel more connected to this thing. And also, you can always say to them later, look, you decided on this. We decided on this together. You know, and, and so it's powerful. Okay? So the next thing you got to do is post them somewhere. All right? And, and this is on us because when we do this, we're making a promise to our team. Okay? We are promising that we're going to uphold these values. All right, and so we have to stick to them. And it's very easy to forget or to let them slide, and we can't do that. Otherwise, it just becomes words on the wall that are meaningless, and it hasn't really become like a foundational thing that determines how we behave in our particular program. So every one of your programs are different. All of you are unique leaders, and you're going to lend your uniqueness to your particular program and make it your own. That's important. All right, so you post the rules and stick to them. The next thing <clears throat> that was extremely valuable for us was to delve into our core values. Along with filming our practices, really clearly defining and diving deeper into our core values, those were the two most valuable things that our program has done in recent memory. So, you gotta ask yourself this question. What do I stand for? 
So we're going to go through the core values exercise together. Okay? And ideally, you start with yourself. Okay? And I'll recommend a book at the end of, of, of the talk here that can help you with this process. Ideally, you start with yourself and you, and you start with your own personal values. Okay? Figure out what you stand for. Figure out what your team stands for. All right? And then you got to make sure the team knows what you stand for. Okay? And, and maybe some of you in the audience are saying, you know, why should I do this when I run a small club and we train two nights a week and, you know, it's just kind of, I don't really, why? Um, it's just that if you're a good leader, if you're, if you're a well-developed leader, this is just an essential part of leadership. And, and you will reap the benefits of doing this if you really take it seriously. If you really think about your team, what do you stand for? Um, then it, it's going to help your group, I promise you that. It takes work. It's not just something like, hey, you know, like one of these fad diets, you just do it. It takes work, but you, you will reap the benefits. You'll create something special to your group, and you'll see how it can really just keep growing into something where it, that your players embody this stuff and they live it, okay? So, um, again, we're just building our, our foundation. So, the core, core values um, exercise works like this. Okay, we are going to, you know, in, in, in our case, I started out seven years ago at Davis, and we had our, I decided these are going to be the core values for our program. Toughness, resilience, teamwork, HYS, and Aggie pride. Okay, those are our core values. So, great, we got this, uh, we remodeled the team room ourselves. We put up these um, banners on the wall that, like wallpaper, but you put them up and all of our values are up there in the team room. I'm like, yes, this is great. And then we did nothing. And there are words on the wall that we reference every now and then, but what don't really know what they mean. Okay, so going through this core values exercise was really valuable. It works like this. <clears throat> you gotta think of the values that you want to use to describe your program. Okay, that's the first step. The next step is, again, I'm gonna share these slides with you guys so you don't really have to write everything down unless you want to, that's perfectly fine. Now you gotta define the values in specific terms for your team, and I'm gonna give you an example here in a second. But this is an important step because, I don't know, give me a value that you'd like your team to represent. Can you think of one? Respect. Respect, perfect. Okay, what does respect mean? We're going to use the Oxford Dictionary for this. Respect means, you know, and here's the little the letters that tell you how to pronounce it. I do this. Okay, that's great. That's a definition for everybody. What's our definition of respect? Being on time. Okay, that's great. So we're starting to get to a definition, but that, this is the important part, right? That we have this core value, and then we decide, okay, this is what it means in our program. This is something for us, okay? And then the next step is that you come up with three to five observable behaviors for each value, okay? And so now we can say, <clears throat> you, you uh, gave an observable behavior, so maybe we would be a little bit more general with our definition of what respect means uh, in the program, and then this is an observable behavior. I'm on time, all right? And the idea is that if you were to walk <clears throat> on my pool deck, and I had my list of core values, I can hand you the sheet and say, here, here's our core values, here's our observable behaviors, and you, as a person who is just arriving on our pool deck, could sit and watch and see if we were representing those values. All right, so they're tangible, observable behaviors that we decide what we want. And that's really the goal. And that helps you kind of just drill down deeper into what it means. Okay, the goal is to be as specific as possible so that a person from outside the program can observe these behaviors, all right? And like I said, ideally you start with yourself first. In the, in the, in the, in the sense of time here, we're, we're gonna start with team values. But ideally we do this personally. So how many of you in the audience are willing to take this time to explore your own personal core values, come up with definitions for them, and three to five observable behaviors that your partner can tell you, hey, you're not really representing that one today, or hey, you're doing a great job with this. This is a little bit of self-examination uh, that's important for leadership. Okay, so here's an example, right? I just came up with this off the cuff. I want my team to be unselfish, all right? So then 
We decided on the value. Here's a uh, definition. We think of others before we think of ourselves. Okay? That was my definition in relation to our team. And then let's come up with some observable behaviors that we can use to apply to this. One, we thank our teammates audibly when they make a good pass. Okay? So if somebody were to walk on the pool deck, they would say, wow, they're saying thank you a lot. It doesn't have to be thank you. It could be your own special word that you say. Maybe it's, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it could be anything. Anything. It could be Conan. Um, but that you're, this is something that I can observe and say, wow, these guys are really representing this value. Okay? Another one. <clears throat> we celebrate our teammate's success by saying <clears throat> whatever the word is. Okay? So these are really specific. You can observe it. Next, we check in regularly on our teammates, especially those that are going through difficult times. Okay, now, here is where, an example where you can run into some difficulties, right? So this is said with the best of intentions, right? But could somebody really observe whether or not I was checking in on my teammate if they're going through difficult times? These are the guidelines for it. Does it necessarily have to be that every single rule is like somebody can come on the deck and observe it? No, you, you can, there's some leeway built in there where you can make decisions about what you want to do, okay? Another one I came up with, we look to make the extra pass when it's available. Could a person who doesn't know water polo come on the pool deck and see that, um, you know, I'm wide open in front of the cage, but somebody jumps me and I make the pass to the next player? Maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. Or they could just see, wow, they're making a lot of nice passes to open guys. Um, but I, I still feel that, the, that this would be a valuable definition. I think it's fine. And, and maybe it's not exactly according to the observable behavior definition, but it's fine. Okay, the point is, we've delved down a little bit deeper. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so let's try the exercise together, okay? This is where I need your help. So let's uh, think of some values that we would like to represent our team. So you said respect, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> what what other some other ones? Integrity. Integrity. Excellent. These are all great. I love this stuff. Well, Accountability. Accountability. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. Loyalty. Loyalty. Alright. We're getting the picture here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's pick one of these. You don't have to the time to analyze all of them. Let's pick one and try to come up with a definition for our team. Is there one that you'd like to choose? Okay, I will choose accountability. All right. So who said accountability? What's your, oh, this is your school. Yes. Okay. Do you have a specific, is this one of your core values? Correct, yes. Do you have a specific definition for accountability in your program? I uh, would say like we are, like our part of our mission statement is we are, you know, pursuing excellence through accountability with our teammates. So okay. The goal is to be accountable to the teammates, to the team. Okay. I mean, like we identify it as being on time, it's practicing with enthusiasm, it's picking <coughs> each other up, and, um, like, and again, we have we have a definition on game day and in practice. Cool. Okay. So you have multiple. So have you done this particular exercise the co of defining? So Brian Alexander, we did something similar. Great. Right. Okay. Um, so we are. Uh, the definition of accountability in this program is that we 
something in regards to our teammates. We maybe it's what? Hold each other to a high standard. Okay, we hold each other to a high standard. All right, that's great. All right, and now. Okay, and now we would come up with our three to five observable behaviors for this particular definition. Okay, so what could be some of them? On t be on time, right? Okay, what does on time mean? Like being early. early. So how early? <coughs> 10 minutes early. Okay, on time is 10, that's the kind of the saying, right? On time is 10 minutes early. Is that specific? Could I observe that and say these guys are on time? Totally, all right? We are, on time is, 10 minutes early. What next? Something else. Um, always lighting up when you're passing, like putting in full effort. Okay. See, this is an excellent intention, putting in full effort. What does full effort mean? What does legging up when you're passing mean? Right? Yeah. Um, what could we say that's more specific than, uh, you know, maybe I could choose a spot on my body that I want to be out of the water to when I pass the ball. Maybe it's middle chest out of the water on every pass, right? And that way we could say, all right, you are representing the value or you are way above it, which is fantastic, or hey, you got to do a little bit better, right? So as specific as you can get, as observable as you can get, mid chest out. What's another one? Anybody? Prepared, ready to go. Okay, what does that mean? You have your gear, your dress on time. Okay, so you got your uniform for on game day. You have these specific things all in order. Your gear on game day, we are. Okay, our gear is ready. And so then you have to describe what that meant, right? Everybody has the same gear, you got your duffel bag, it's got this, 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 and, and, and that stuff matters, honestly. Drilling down to this level of detail matters, all right? And so this is what you do. And this is a great exercise to go through with your team. And again, to give your team input in these definitions and to come to an agreement together rather than me just top down saying, this is what it is, you know, there's some of that. And you're gonna make the ultimate decision about what's good and what isn't, what you want and what you don't. But going through it with your team is valuable. You're, you're bringing people together. You're uh, having cooperation amongst your team. And I personally am always impressed with my guys when they begin to speak. Okay, always. <laughs> Very often, I feel like I need to speak less and they need to speak more. And you might be surprised with what your kids are saying. These are smart people, right? Is this a year to year thing or would you keep the same <clears throat> values? Great question, thank you. No, this is like, we're establishing our values and the values don't change. We can tweak the definitions a little bit, right? But we really don't want to. Um, I think that as you go through the exercise, some tweaking is inevitable. You're not gonna get it perfect the first time. But overall, your values don't change. And the people graduate, and the new people come in, and they're plugged into this culture that already exists, and they figure out, hey, what we stand for, how we have to behave, and that's important. All right, so when you do this, you gotta be really conscious that these are the values that you really, truly wanna represent. All right, and like I said, give your, give your team power in doing that, and you'll find uh, that you reap the benefits. Okay, the other, um, and that's basically uh, how the exercise works, all right? So um, I strongly, strongly urge you to take the time. Again, as you, as you learn more about leadership and coaching, and if you are really, really into trying to figure out what it's all about, like what is this thing we're doing all about? It's not just I show up on the pool deck 10 minutes before and we go, hey, we're going to do this drill and that drill. And I, I don't, it's, not, it's way deeper than that. So have the desire to dig a little bit deeper. Read some books. I'll, I'll suggest you some books here at the end. And, and take time to explore your culture. Okay? Because it matters. All right, so here's our core values at UC Davis. Toughness, resilience, teamwork, HYS, and Aggie pride. I'm not going to tell you what HYS is. Mm -hmm. It's our little thing. Okay? 
Again, we took time to come up with this. They were sitting up on the wall forever, and we took time to go through this exercise, and it, and it was one of the, the most important things that we've done. I will, I will give you one definition. Our definition of teamwork, all right? <clears throat> How we treat each other is the most important thing. So I was um, heavily influenced by this book called The Culture Code, <coughs> right? And this, this idea came from that book. I'm not gonna tell you that I invented this. I feel like uh, this, this statement, this definition, encompasses more than just how you and I treat each other. This encompasses how I pass you the ball, okay? How we treat each other, how I pass you the ball matters. Do I cover for you and transition when you're beat without fail? Do I have your back? Am I taking care of you outside the water as well? Am I wrangling you by the neck when you're making a bad decision out there? Am I checking in on you when, when uh, you're down? Am I trying to lift you up? Are we, do we have love for each other, right, in our group? And then one of the observable behaviors that we said about teamwork was we point at each other. Okay, stolen directly from Duke basketball. Stolen, not an original idea. Duke basketball, I read, in some, at some point, decided that they were going to point at each other to recognize successful plays. And, and like nice pass or something like that, right? So the cool thing about this was that the fans, the Cameron crazies, they kind of picked up on it too. So what ended up happening was that the fans started pointing at the guy too. So everybody's pointing at the guy that made the assist, right? I thought that was so cool. And it makes sense in water polo also because a lot of times I'm receiving a pass from uh, you up there and you're 15 yards away from me, and it's a great pass, and it doesn't make sense for me to go swim over to you and make physical contact with you. It just takes too long. It doesn't make sense. Physical contact is important. High fives are important. Fist bumps are important. Like, gra you know, grabbing someone around the head and saying thank you, that's important. There's a bond that's created when you make this physical contact. Okay? But if your players are too far away, it doesn't make sense. So instead of me swimming over, I make sure, we want our guys on our team to make sure that we point at each other. And this is an observable behavior that someone can come on the pool deck and, and say. That the fans have not picked up on this yet, you know, but we're hopeful. Um, and then the thing about it is that we remind, we have to remind our guys. Like there's been instances, and, and it's interesting, it's very interesting to see, you know that you have some more selfish players, self-centered players than less on your teams, right? Some people are more selfish than others. And those are the people that forget to point. And you have to remind them, hey, so sometimes the guy's sitting there going like this, and the guy's going like this, and we have to say, no, you didn't point at him yet, point. You gotta remind. And this is, a, a, this is something that I like. We're recognizing each other's success. We're maintaining connection with each other even though we're far away, right? Do they point back to it? Yeah, we point at, we go I acknowledge that you gave that to me. I go, great question, and you point at me. There you go, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and the cool thing about this is like when you, when, you, when you start to live your core values, they become something different. And so you see your team start to reference the core values outside of the water. So now it's becoming a culture. For example, you might bring me like a Big Al's Italian beef sandwich when I'm hungry one day, and I would point at you and go, yes, thank you, <laughs> right? Another one of our values is resilience. And one of the things that, that we say in terms of resilience is next play, okay? The play that just happened isn't the one that matters, next play. So I can't tell you the amount of times that my guys have said to me, next play, in like a lot of different contexts, like, hey guys, I'm sorry, I, I mess this up. Maybe I call a bad timeout or something like that. Coach next play. I'm like, oh man, that's so cool, right? That's great. Or even something outside the water, like in a joking manner. Next play, coach. It's awesome. So it becomes something that's now this thing that's living and um, growing stronger and it's really good. Important. So the next thing you've done, you've, you've taken the time, you got to talk about your core values all the time. You got to talk about them every day. How do we do that? Okay, I'll give you some ideas. One, make a mantra. Okay? Toughness, resilience, teamwork, HMS, Aggie Pride. Those are our core values. 
We can use this cheer, mantra, whatever it is, to break down a practice, to start a practice, to break down or start a weight training session. We can use it between quarters in a game. We can use it before the game. We can use it after a team meeting before a game. We can use it whenever we want, but we're repeating it and we're saying it and becomes something that is easy to remember. So make, your, make sure you make your values rhythmic so you can make a nice cheer with it. All right? Reference your values when, when talking about how you want to play. Okay? So I can't tell you the number of times that we have said in pre-game meetings, guys, what we, need to, what we need to do in this game after we've gone through all the X's and O's and the scouting and this and that is we need to represent our core values. Okay? And we use them as a reference in how we want to play the game or how we want to train. Talk about the values after practice. Sarah, you were so resilient today. I heard you saying next play all, uh, all, all practice long. Way to go. Everybody, we were pointing at each other today. Talk about it. You can't just throw them up on the wall and then forget. In terms of performance review, okay? So if you're having a meeting with one of your players and you're talking about <clears throat> how they're doing, you can tell them, hey, you, you really represent our core values well in this particular way. Okay? Or you need a little bit of work in the uh, teamwork aspect of it, or whatever it may be. Use it as a performance review. Also, I'm a big fan of making things cryptic. And so HYS, you know, we have this thing that nobody knows what it is. We put our core values, <coughs> the initials of our core values on the backs of our caps. <coughs> and it's T-R-T-H-Y-S-A-P. It makes no sense to somebody who looks at it, except us, right? So these are special things for our program only. So if you can make these little things that are your own and nobody on the outside knows what it is, it's your special little thing. That's important in creating culture. So I urge you to have fun with it, okay? This guy's name is Frosty Westering. He was a very, very successful Division III football coach. One of the things that he talked about or he did with his team was that they used to sing together. And um, it's not very common that teams sing, right? But he had a reason for it. When, when you sing, your consciousness is raised. So this is, a, this is in reference to having fun with your core values, just so you know it's not completely out of the blue, all right? So I had this idea for a long time. I, I like, there's a lot of music. I like music. I play the guitar. I decided I want to try singing with my team. I want to see what it's like. I think it would be fun, okay? And there's a reason honestly, that groups sing together. Church, you sing. At camps, you sing. It creates a bond between people. It's scientifically proven to create a bond between people. Also, it's super fun. Okay? And another thing that came from this book, The Culture Code, and I'll show you the slide, is that you're, one of the important things about your culture is something that's called shared vulnerability. You guys, you're familiar with shared vulnerability. So shared, this book uh, states that shared vulnerability is really, really important. And essentially what it means is that your athletes feel safe to make mistakes in your program, right? They feel the freedom to express themselves and to make mistakes. And by making mistakes, their, their learning process is sped up. We learn more when we're, when we're not in fear of making mistakes. And one of the ways that we can do this is show vulnerability to each other. And singing is a great way to do that because most people, let's be honest, don't sing until they've had several glasses of alcohol and their inhibitions are down. <laughs> it's true. We're, we're self-conscious about it. And so we have to get over this fact that we're self-conscious and we have to share this vulnerability with each other and it brings the group closer. So one of the things that I did is, are you guys familiar with the song Take Me Home Country Road? Yes. Everybody knows that song. Fun to sing. So I rewrote the words to take me home the country road <laughs> to represent our core values, and I called it Old Davis Road. And so you'll see here that we sing this song together. To the place I With some blocking. Shall the
See? It makes you smile, right? <laughs> it's fun. So I urge you to be creative with how you uh, talk about your values. Be yourself. Do something unique. Not, most of you will probably not pick up a guitar and go sing in front of your team. That's fine. Do something. Do your own thing. Okay? These are some of the books that were very influential in, in learning about culture for me. So the one on the left, the Culture Engine, describes the, the uh, core values exercise in great detail. And it takes you through step by step. The Culture Code was very important um, in terms of some other stuff. And then this book, Culture Defeat Strategy, is written by a high school football coach from Texas. And it, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. These football coaches, I tell you, man, they, they think about stuff. They come up with good stuff. There's no reason why we shouldn't be taking some stuff from these guys. And some of it's a little bit hokey. Some of it's a little like, you know, like let's bash our heads together type stuff. Um, but it's, there's a lot of good stuff in this book. So we should take material from wherever we can. All right? All right, so moving forward. Another thing, uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time on the goals, okay? So you're, you're, but I will say this, your program should have goals. S clearly stated goals, outcome goals, and process goals, and these are something that should be posted up on the wall somewhere or talked about somewhere. We know what the goals are, okay? So the outcome goals are results related, okay? And it's fine to have outcome goals, but really what are more important are the process goals that are the steps needed to obtain your outcome goals, okay? So, here's an example, all right? I want to learn the wrap shot. You guys know what the wrap shot is? So the wrap around shot, so if the blocker has one arm up and I'm shooting the ball around his arm. Very important shot, your players should know this shot, okay? Uh, so a guy comes into my office and says, I want to learn the wrap shot. Great, there's an outcome goal, right? It's kind of like saying, we want to work hard in practice. Okay, sounds great. I want to learn the wrap shot. All right, that's great. So let's talk about the process goal that's going to lead you up to being able to shoot the wrap shot, okay? Here's the process. I commit to going to the pool three times a week and shooting for 10 weeks and shooting 30 wraps. So that's in 10 weeks. How many wraps is that? Is that 900? 30 times... 90 a week times 10, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, because the question is really, like, you want to learn a shot. How many reps is it going to take for you to learn this shot? How many? I don't know. Nobody knows. 10,000 is the, is the claimed uh, amount, right? How are you going to get to 10? Let's say there's no chance. But it's certainly, it's certainly in the hundreds. Right? Before I'm going to feel confident in an important game to beat you like that around the block. We know this to be true. So a process goal is specific, as specific as you can possibly get. Even I want to come to the pool two times a week. Not specific enough. I want to come and I want to shoot 30 wraps. But not only that, they have to go in a specific location. They have to go and skip in the upper corner. And I could use a sniper or whatever it may be. Okay, and now I've really got something that says, okay, I'm gonna get 900 reps by the end of 10 weeks at this shot. I think I'm gonna be pretty good at it. I think I'm gonna be feeling pretty confident in this shot, right? So there's an example of a process goal uh, and how specific we need to be for individual or for your team. Very important. We get caught up and say like, guys come in my house all the time. Like I call the chair across from my desk the empty promises chair. Because <laughs> everybody comes to my office, they tell me everything I want to hear. Yeah, coach, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And, you know, really? Let's see it. I want it. I'm happy for you. Let's do it. Show me how. Our outcome goals for UC Davis men's water polo. One, win an NCAA championship. So, you cynics in the room, I know. I know you're saying, no chance, right? That's okay, you're, you're not for our program. <laughs> win, win the WWPA conference, we want to win conference every year. Win the NCAA playing game and advance to the final four, and we want our team GPA to be above 3.0. Those are our goals, every year. Okay, and the goals can change, um, but those are ours and they're stated, okay? And then 
again, the process goals would be, I'm not going to go into our process goals for this, but the process goals would be the steps that you're going to take to get you to those goals. All right. And again, leadership from your players, allowing your players to have input on process goals is powerful. And again, you can, you know, for lack of a better word, you can hold it over their head and say, look, you committed to doing this. We're not doing it or we are doing it. this is great. Okay. It provides like a direction for your players of where they can go. All right. Um, even if your goals aren't perfect, I can assure you that you'll benefit in some way from doing this exercise. And if you really like it and if you really keep going with it, you'll greatly benefit from it. All right, individual goals. If you have time to meet with each player, that's great. A lot of you are saying, I don't have time to meet with each player. So how do we do it? Homework, email, take this home. Here are the specific instructions. I want you to come up with three process goals for this upcoming season. You know what? The, the, your outcome goal may be, you know what? I want to have a winning record this year. Maybe I haven't had a winning record in 15 years. I want a winning record this year. Or our goal is to have a winning record. Then you get a winning record and you say, now our goal is to beat Conan or Fenwick, one of these teams, right? Then the process, all right? So if you don't have time to meet with each, each person individually, you can use email and say, come back at me with this stuff and we can go back and forth. I know time is a real factor. Your team goals, you can decide together. And then make sure you follow up. Okay, because it's very easy to just talk about the goals again and talk about individual process goals and yeah, I got this document that says this and then we just go and forget about it. Got to follow up. Okay, very, very important. And this is what it looks like when your team culture is strong. Any questions? All right, thank you. Uh, lunch is served. Uh, lunch is served. We can have some lunch.